It's another week in the foyer of friends household and it is another jam-packed non-spoiler reference max. Mm. Are you ready to get weird and nasty, OT? Sure I am. Let's get on with the show. Friends and lovers, welcome back to the Four Year Reference Podcast. You got your host, Katie. And Doty. On the docket today, we have two recent releases or on the way releases in Australian cinemas, Infinity Pool as well as Limbo. And we've also got a couple of screeners for TV shows, Bupkiss, which is currently available now, Slip, which is also available now, and season three of the other two. Mm -hmm. I said it on a Black Lady sketch show, but also with the other two, it's nice to get screeners for things we already watch (laughs) that is true (laughs) well speaking of things that we've never watched and we're diving into let's get into infinity pool thanks so much to carly and the team at nixco for not only giving us early access to infinity pool but also um helping us coordinate the interview with brendan cronenberg yeah how are you feeling after the interview by the way Good. It was really exciting, wasn't it? It was really good. Um, Friends and lovers, we did get the opportunity um, of watching it and then watching it again before the interview. It's currently in um, Australian cinemas at the moment. So if you're having a nasty time, it recently we talked about Quantum Cowboys, the fantastic film festival, Australia. Infinity Pool also did a preview screening um, there as well. But it's very exciting. We said we were going to talk about it and we always take the lead of the career creators and Brandon Connerberg actually went into more detail than I thought he would in the interview. Yeah. Right. Um, so welcome, welcome friends and lovers. Um, we're not going to spoil anything today, but there are some things that I definitely want to touch on, um, especially in regards to infinity pool. So written and directed by Brandon Cronenberg in regards to stars, 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 Alexander Skarsgård, Mia Graf. <laughs> I'm trying to yell the way she was yelling. She haunts me in my dreams now, OT. Wow. I'm sure she enters other people's dreams, but she's haunting mine. Are we um, calling those n- haunting dreams right now, eh? That's what my web browser tells me. <laughs> um, as well as Cleopatra Coleman. But let's get into first impressions. There's a lot of interesting themes. And also, again, I, w- I do want to give kudos to Brendan because you know, when you do an interview, you never really know how the questions are going to land or, you know, maybe it's just been a long sort of junket, but Brendan really went there with us. So I, I'm really glad that we got to have, um, the interview that we did. So first impression, sir. It was a provocative, chilling exploration of moral descent and dehumanization. It brilliantly blends dystopia and hedonism, creating an unsettling atmosphere that leaves a lasting impact. Went on a journey of most of his movies and you could see a pattern. Mm. I think the way he did it in Infinity Pool just made it all work and make sense. And I think after the second viewing, I think I got it even more. Okay, all right. You know, there's, there's the initial trepidation Uh, The first time you watch a movie and you're trying to grasp everything. And I think a lot of the times when you're left with feelings of either confusion, um, I think the second viewing brought it all back to the surface. And I think I got a lot more out of it. Mm -hmm. And the interview helped overlay, like explained to me decisions that he made in the movie that I was like... Ah, uh, all right. I see that. Yeah, it's a certain type of privilege to want to know the question, to be like, excuse me, I have a question. You can literally ask it, right? Yeah. It's honestly, it's one of my favorite interviews we've done recently. Oh, 100%. Like literally just being able to, you know, and I also said it in the interview as well. Like I'm a very literal person. So to watch a film that is very aesthetic forward, usually it frustrates me. Like, Like I get really like frustrated watching films where not to say that there isn't a plot, but there's a lot of focus on the aesthetics and the visuals. But so for some reason, may, may it be performance, may it be storytelling, may it be compelling visuals. I wasn't frustrated while we were getting to where we needed to go. Yeah. And you can tell he's a very visual person. I really enjoyed this. 
Infinity Pool dives into the depraved, unchecked privilege of wealth and power. Aesthetically, primal, sensual, and evocative. Oh. Given the subject matter of the film, I'm surprised that Brendan didn't like bat an eye at me saying sensual about this film. <laughs> like it made, what it was. It made me blush. Mm. And that's saying something if you've definitely listened to it. I thought that was your default state, bro. I know, right? <laughs> um, I was just like, oh my, we need to try some new techniques, OT. <laughs> <laughs> But there are a couple of things um, that were also surfaced in the interview um, that aren't spoilers from the point of view that we talked about it in the interview that I want to talk about. And there was one particular quote that was um, in the film. So it's in a fictional place, which I also want to talk about. But the quote was, our country is not a playground for foreign children. Mm-hmm. Layers, you know, uh, we, we often get movies with tourists going into different countries and acting a fool. Volunteerism, did you say? Mm-hmm. Slum tourism, did you say? Mm-hmm. You know, it's an issue that barely or rarely gets talked about, but we see it happen, you know, yeah. we see it all the time. And I feel like the way this was portrayed I loved the consequences. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, it was bound to happen. And um, it was interesting, especially as you're saying that it wasn't like, you know, it was a deliberate decision not to set it in the real world because it does become the commentary of that particular place. And we're kind of just focusing on, you know, that unchecked sort of power. How, How depraved can you be or does it depend on your bank account or perhaps your bonds? Both. It depends on both. I think the the luxury of you having all the wealth in the world means that you feel like you can get away with pretty much anything and everyone is your plaything. And it's covered here quite well. You can see the nonchalance of the characters and paying no attention to where they are, the culture, yeah. they don't give a shit. No. Nope. You know, they I think the first time initially when he when you see the movie and the concept, you're like, oh, interesting, you know? Um, it's sort of scary at the first time I was like, oh, I feel for the main characters. Mm, but after really? a while, yeah. Because oh, of, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> You didn't? Bruh, you know, between this and succession, there's a lot of unchecked fortune. (laughs) Well, I I, I was trying to empathize, even though I couldn't. Yeah, and only when it continued progressing, I was like, okay, so these guys are fucked, eh? (laughs) It took you that long to realize that? No, like, you'd always want to give the protagonist the benefit of doubt. Uh Uh-huh. Until they show you that they're not worth it, then and only then should you check out. Yeah. It it was interesting, um, you know, speaking to Brendan and he talked about, you know, what, setting a film in an alternate reality can offer because you're not bogged down by real world, real life sort of logic. Right. So even when it goes full balls to the wall, it's like, yeah, that makes all the sense in this world. What did you think about, um, when we asked Brendan the question about, is there a balance between accessibility and creativity? And it's not lost on me that we were also getting deep into the Fast and Furious franchise when um, the interview dropped as well. There has to be a balance. I remember us watching Lido and thinking, what the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) I think there's a balance. uh, In as much as you don't want to spoon feed someone, you don't want to create something that's too open to interpretation, the way it loses, it could lose meaning. But the interesting thing is, I feel like this film was all interpretation. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, oh, for sure. I just mean like, there's... I agree. You don't want to spoon feed people and you want them to critically think about what they can take out of the movie and what it it means for them personally. But I think we've watched movies where we were like at the end of it thinking, okay, I I get it. Mm. (laughs) I can see where you're going with it, but it, it didn't make sense. But that's the interesting thing because I feel like I experienced, I experienced so much confusion watching this film, but I was also okay to be taken along 
um, on the adventure. And I think comparing um, Possessor with Infinity Pool, um, that kind of felt a bit more grounded than Infinity Pool, if that makes sense. Yeah. Also, um, you know, storylines that might feel farcical um, in Possessor, I will just point to the Times article about 150 union workers that worked on, you know, what's now known as ChatGPT um, unionizing in Nairobi, Kenya. So even though it felt like a very ridiculous plot line, it's it's even though it's also not based in real life as well. I'm like, ah, okay, kind of makes sense in this fucked up world. You know what I mean? So I I, I just think it's a very interesting and maybe, you know, it's it's that Brendan Cronenberg, that Mia Goff, that Alexander Skarsgård magic that just kept me along on the ride because usually I would get frustrated with these sorts of films. So it was interesting that I was able to keep, you know, just keep plugging along the way. Yeah, I, I love being taken on the journey and I think the performances of Mia and Skarsgård were top shelf stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and wow, she's currently in a lot. She is. Um, mm. But apparently this was also before she had been confirmed for everything, um, even though she's become the horror darling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pills. I I did want to um talk about something only because it was brought up in the interview because I didn't even think it would be something we could talk about um non spoiler wise. But it's also you know in the trailer as well if you've watched it. I kind of want to talk about the doubling sort of technology and I guess where you landed um from a watching sort of experience. Um you know it kind of gives those people that are rich and that are able to a second sort of chance um and i was just wondering how that how it worked if it worked for you it worked i think it made uh, it created a lot of different narratives that you could have in the movie and different explanations because at the end of it you couldn't even tell um you wouldn't be able to tell who's the actual who's the clone and who's not because mm-hmm. you're out of it most of the time yeah. did they kill the me or the clone like all these questions arise and you don't know what's what uh-huh. so i found it intriguing i think it's something that of course it will only be available to the super wealthy yeah where they could do atrocious things without any consequence yeah all right well um like we said Infinity Pool is currently in Australian cinemas. Thank you to Carly and the team at Nixco as well as Maslow Entertainment. Are you ready to go on to the next feature film, OT? Yeah, bring it. All right. So this film is due to come out this week um, on May 18th. This is coming out of director Ivan Sen. (laughs) Next on the timeline, friends and lovers, you will see um, we had the opportunity to interview Ivan Sen. Mm -hmm. And it's been a long time coming. We've been friends and lovers of his work, particularly Mystery Road films, for years now. We have. It was very exciting. Um, In regards to the cast, 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 we have Simon Baker, Rob Collins, Natasha Wanganin, Nicholas Hope, and a whole bunch of talented um, local Indigenous um, talent as well. So, first impressions, OT? Oh, um... A raw, compelling narrative that delves into Australia's harsh realities and covering up original injustices via a cold case probe. Um, it's sort of similar to what we've gotten with um, Jay Swan in the Mystery Road series, and I found it um, intriguing that the, pers- the sort of the protagonist sort of changed, mm-hmm. and I felt that was a bigger issue that we could possibly delve into a spoiler review later on because I think we'd have so much more to say. Oh, yes. My body is moving to the rhythm of your beats, OT. Mm. I feel it. Uh, Limbo is another offering on an existing solid foundation Ivan Sen has built to explore important issues. Ooh. Unfortunately, OT wasn't able to make the interview, so um, we prepared together, but um, I was the one that had the opportunity to interview um, Ivan Sen, but you've also had the opportunity to hear the interview. 
I have. Right? Um, and we uh, we might as well start off with this because this is our first question. Friends and lovers, um, for those that are eager to dive into Indigenous storytelling all around the world, um, I think it might have been, if not the first, one of the first episodes we did on January 26th, um, and it was covering the Mystery Road series, which surrounds the films as well as the TV show, but not the current um, origin um, story. So, you know, we've loved this universe, I guess, if, if for lack of better word. Um, but essentially, like you were saying, we have an Aboriginal detective that goes usually to rural outback areas in Australia and focuses on and investigates, you know, issues, cases to do with the Indigenous community. Mm. Um, a lot of the focus, especially in the earlier films, um, as well as in Limbo, focuses on young missing Indigenous girls. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is we're still putting the same focus on these important issues, but we're putting it in the lens of a white detective. Mm. So what I thought was really interesting, um, especially in the press notes um, that were made available to us as well, um, it talks about how, you know, a lot of the experiences of Ivan Sen and a lot of the people around him, unfortunately, it, it's not uncommon to experience lack of or slow action in regards to the judicial system, mm-hmm. which I guess can also be channeled through law enforcement and also detectives as well. So while it is playing or at least addressing, you know, important issues for the Aboriginal community all around this country, um, it, it brings to light different sort of perspectives or different um different sort of challenges that aren't being addressed in a in a country that has been gained through violent means and is unseated and stolen in every way. Yeah, 100%. I think also in Travis, we see how different the lens is and how mm-hmm. he looks at things, you know, because I'm so used to the J. Swan perspective of it. Yeah. You know, and that's all I've sort of known and yeah. that's what we've sort of seen so far. So it was intriguing to get this perspective where where his perspective um, while investigating this and him trying to uncover what exactly what happened takes a unique turn that sort of creates a, a thrilling sort of movie to watch. I was frustrated. Uh, say your frustrations. But I think that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Where you would have Jay Swan literally kicking people in the face. <laughs> like, the 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 justice, if ever moving, was was slow bearing. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it, whether you want to call it indifference, uh, those tattoos were a bit questionable on Travis's character. Um, whatever you want to call it, there was absolutely uh, a reluctance to be able to help the people that he's there to help, right? Mm. So so to me, I found it very frustrating, but I'm pretty sure that was the effect of the film. All right, I, I can see where you're coming from, and I, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it, it took such a different turn from what I expected the movie to be. Mm-hmm. You know, even its use in um, it being black and white yeah. was interesting you know it, it, seeing the outback in a different picture and the cinematography it's quite unique and i don't think we've seen that before mm. even the i think you raised this in the interview as well you know shooting in underground caves and yeah how that all worked it creates this sort of fly on the wall effect i didn't want to geek out on him but it reminded me of bong joon ho in the criterion um edition where he was talking about the 1960 housemaid oh yeah and he was talking about the different levels. Friends and lovers, I am a wanker in many ways, including a film wanker. Um, go and check out our Parasite episode, friends and lovers. Um, but the use of, I guess, you know, ground level and going below ground, um, albeit necessary for the hot climate, but definitely playing into, you know, the different sort of dynamics that also translate from a storytelling point of view. Oh, 100%. It was, it was interesting in the interview, um, you know, because to say anything 
is to already be political or to already be having a conversation that people aren't willing to have, right? So to have the Mystery Road films as well as Goldstone films that really are unflinching in, you know, the, the uh, I, I guess, the default wanting to look away on Aboriginal issues, to continue that in the film, in a film in the 2020s and to also cast a white um, actor as the detective is absolutely going to bring conversation in this country, much needed conversation in this country, right? Yeah, I think so and hope so as well. So it was interesting in the interview when I asked, does he want to create a mirror or does he want to open a dialogue? Yeah, I think it'd be a bit of from column A, column B. Um, I think it should it should make us look inwards and reflect ourselves and seeing what we are as a society, whilst also making us want to talk about these things mm-hmm. openly and making it less of a ooh taboo subject where we can't even say anything. You know, I think it's interesting because watching the film and and maybe you know this is more of me bringing my love of the existing films to this. I thought I thought it was very clear. I thought it was very clear that if not yesterday, today is the day where we talk about hard shit. Today is the day that we talk about all of the deaths in custody since, you know, 1991, where we were told there wouldn't be any more Indigenous deaths in custody, right? This will be the time we talk about missing young Aboriginal kids or even, you know, being displaced from their homes. This is the time that we talk about it, right? Um, But it was interesting hearing Ivan talk because it it, it kind of brought, uh, I guess, a different sort of dimension to that sort of messaging throughout the films as well Mm. yeah i hear what you're saying and is it something that you thought was reflective in the movie while you watched it (sighs) i I think it was i I think it was addressed in in ways that i was expecting but i also appreciated the extra sort of context you know being able to have a conversation at talanoa with ivan nice it was a really good interview um it'll be releasing tomorrow look at that how exciting um thank you again to harriet the team at nixco um as well as obviously ivan sen limbo will be out in australian cinemas on may 18th make sure you all go check it out in droves Mm-hmm. Are you ready for something light but delicious? Ooh. I'm pretty sure he's been used to be described this way. We're talking about Pete Davidson's bupkis. <laughs> Well, what can I say about this show? I think there's an endearing element of Pete Davidson that just shows in his stuff that he works on. He exposes himself and puts himself out there so vulnerably for all to see. And it feels very raw and authentic. And that's what you get with Bunkus. You know, you'll get your hijinks, of course, but you'll also get to learn more about him as a person yeah, and as a character in the show. You'll get to appreciate him more, I think. Uh, It's one of those quaint little shows that I thought, oh, we breezed through this quite easily. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, I remember us watching King of Staten Island. Yeah. And loving it. Yes. You know, it it feels like that having a baby and just getting even more ridiculous characters on board. Are we having a baby with Pete Davidson? Is that what you're saying? We are. And Needy Falco, if that's okay. Of course. Well, we wouldn't even wash our shots. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but it it, it just creates ridiculous moments that i laugh out loud and i love bumpkiss it's one of the shows i think i would definitely want to go back and rewatch um but yeah what about you following on from staten island pete davidson has found a way to distill what makes him so charming and so lovable into the hijinks of bupkis oh i you know i might even be a pete davidson gal i don't know if you'll ever get a tattoo of me um but i love him i think he's great um if you want to i guess put a plot of my pete davidson love i was confused seeing him in suicide 
Suicide Squad, but I love seeing him. But I love seeing him in redacted upcoming film. <laughs> I just love him. I have a lot of time for Pete Davidson. Um, and I'm not even talking about the inches, friends and lovers. Um, seeing him on SNL is also great. Um, you know, he talks about mental health. He talks about how he's very open um, about his struggles. And even in the show, he talks about how even though he's open about it, people still talk shit on his name. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a whole there's a whole plot around a very unflattering photo of himself and him trying to take it down um, <laughs> off of the internet. Like, because what, what we have in Bupkis is a gorgeous, earnest Venn diagram of ridiculousness and, 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 and true heart. Mm. You know, th- th- there's a couple of storylines that stay for the most part. You're kind of just watching the episodes as like key and peel episodes. Like they're all just, you know, plug and play fun fanfare to have. Um, I did make some notes while we were watching them and they'll probably make as much sense as watching this show. Um, it has been out for a couple of weeks, but obviously nothing that's going to spoil it. Um, my first note OT is provide the thrust. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you know exactly what I'm saying in regards to that. I would also say my favorite episode of this season is episode two. Mm. That's the Bobby Carnival episode. Yeah. In that he says, this is Staten Island. I'm not going to therapy. I'm not getting divorced. <laughs> he also sings um, a very, I don't know. He doesn't, he doesn't sing a band that you think he would be singing. So that was very funny. Al Gore throwing up the Wu Tang. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Also, just Method Man. Like, <laughs> that's a literal line that I have. Keenan Thompson saying, Did she just pop her pussy? <laughs> John Mulaney, I, I don't know how I feel about him. Um, I did hear the rumors. I appreciated seeing him in this show as well. Like, it's did good. it humanize him? Yeah, yeah. Because okay. a lot of the time you get to read stuff that's just shit, and that's why I detach myself from all that. Yeah, because a I do not know them. Yeah, um, I see them on TV, and that's pretty much it. As far as OT is concerned, they're all their characters because he doesn't want to learn anything about their real lives. Exactly, which is kind of a good thing. It, it's not my place to know about you know i don't want to extend that far because at the end of the day we're all people and you know people are yeah (laughs) (laughs) so whatever happens i don't want to know and i think that's that's the sort of barrier i create for myself and anything that i watch and consume once i've turned off the tv they cease to exist to me yeah I get that. I understand that. Um, And I will say Charlemagne's role on this show is the future of OT. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) May we all be blessed under his banner, Mm -hmm. friends and lovers. (laughs) Let's move on. Um, This is a very quick one. We were given two episodes. Um, Also, thank you for Binge for the Bupkiss screeners as well as Slip Season 1, Episodes 1 and 2. Um, This is... Written, directed, and starring Zoe Lister Jones, um, and it did already premiere in early May. So essentially, the crux of this show is you have a 30 something year old woman that's in a relationship and it's kind of gotten stagnant. Um, so you know, she she finds spicy entanglement ways um to, I guess, re-energize herself. And, you know. It kind of just spawns off of that. Yeah, uh, I think a lot of the time life does get mundane, but it's up to you to talk about it. Um, yeah, talk with, about it. Talk about it. You know, a lot of the times it's easy to just be suffering in silence and blame every other person while you have the power to take control. Okay. Have the power to say something. Okay. Okay. And Slip delves into that. And I think the way they covered it or started the conversation with the first two episodes was quite interesting. And it's really? a- yeah, because it's 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 a journey that everyone you, has to take. But you literally just said take control of your own lives, and then you said you yes, like, I am I am setting the, the scene. It was on the contrary. <laughs> I am setting the scene. All right, bro. Because she has to start from somewhere. It's a show. We need to see character development. We need to see how it ends up, and that's what our great story should entail so her being fully actualized at the start doesn't make sense 
Friends and lovers of the four-year reference court, I direct this to you, OT. Were you frustrated? A little bit. Well, there you go. The court rests, Your Honor. It doesn't mean that I cannot appreciate a Johnny when I see it. I will double down with what you were saying with your full chest before you deflated your chest. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but you're right. Like, if you wake up and, 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 you know, whether it be life happenings, family happenings, work happenings, you know, shit can just pass you by, right? And then you just wake up and be like, what the fuck is this? Like, I didn't sign up for this mundanity, right? Mm -hmm. Do fucking something about it. And I guess if you want to entanglement about it, I guess that's something. But it's also not a very mature way to conduct yourself. Oh, it's not. But some might say, despite what you try and do, life will always be mundane. (laughs) Oh, you're going to monkey see, monkey do. (laughs) Like, I'm, I don't know. I'm here for all of the mess, but I think... In that case, maybe it was a way that it was set up as the premise of the show. And I think it's also not allowing like other characters to also have the same level of messiness. I think that's what it is. Like if if you're going to get into mess, everyone else is open to the mess as well. Yeah. It's a cesspool of messiness. Mm-hmm. And a good starting point for any show. Speaking of a cesspool of messiness, uh, let's finish off with our screeners for the other two. Season three, episodes one and to i don't think we've really talked about it on the podcast but this was also another show that we gobbled all of the episodes up um like in a weekend yeah we yeah i think we watched two seasons yeah we've got molly shannon helene york drew tava as well as case walker wow 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 the full pit ot yeah it's a really funny show it delves into the ridiculous lives of these siblings and <laughs> the journey that ensues. Um, I think it's one of the best shows that we've watched that we sort of never talk about. Yeah. But for whatever reason, I didn't even know season three was coming out until we got the screener. That's a very wanker way to find out. But yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. And it was a pleasant surprise because I thought it was one of those shows that I would watch and, you know, for a moment. Yeah. But... I'm happy Molly Shannon is always great in everything she does. Love, love, love. And wow, her children. Yeah, <laughs> her children. But, you know, it, it's messy as well, but they also, there's a grounding of reality that happens. And I guess the grounding of reality is through Wanda Sykes. Mm-hmm. Put Wanda Sykes in anything, Asterix except Velma, and I'm in. <laughs> Wanda Sykes, I will follow you to the end of the earth. Asterix except for Velma. <laughs> um, also, another great guest star that we love, Josh Sagara, who's currently in the Big Door Prize. Yeah. I love him. He seems really, or at least the roles that I've seen him in, are really very sweet. Mm. Um, We love this show We're so excited to continue the episodes Friends and lovers Join us in the DMs Although we don't talk about it We're absolutely giggle gaggling Something that I really love about it You know thinking about like 30 rock or even, you know, when we talked about, um, Nope, there's when people talk about Hollywood, you can tell that they've been through shit Mm -hmm. (laughs) for everything from like hippy dippy Christian cults, um, all the way to being invisible in the industry, um, to once you turn a particular age and being able to Calvin Klein add your ass away. Like it's just, it's beautiful done literal laugh out loud moments yeah i just love it i love 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 this show um and yeah definitely go and watch your friends and lovers go and watch and it's a weekend binge you'll be able to stop yourself oh absolutely grab a snack and a beverage and a spank on the ass for thanking us <laughs> Thank you, friends and lovers, for joining us. Another edition of Reference Max. We love you, love you, love you. On Twitter and Instagram, we're at For Your F Pod. Write us an email at hellofrpodcast.com. We're also on Infinity Pool is currently in Australian cinemas now. And Limbo will be in Australian cinemas May 18th, as well as Fast X will also be in Australian cinemas May 18th. Check it out. We love yous. See ya. Bye.